Good noon. My name is Jim Anderson. I have the privilege of serving the uh, customers at Cox Health. And indeed, it's also my privilege to welcome you to this uh, noon session. And we appreciate your attendance uh, this noon hour. I would tell you that Cox Health is proud to be a co-sponsor of this public affairs conference. And the theme, Building Healthy Communities, Mind, Body, and Spirit, is uh, so appropriate for us. Uh, that's who we are. That's what we do at Cox Health. And as a result, we are proud to be a presenting sponsor of the Public Affairs Conference. The topic for this noon session, Why Do People Die by Suicide, is not one we readily talk about, but it is for real, unfortunately. Hopefully, as you uh, came in today, you noticed uh, the Field of Memories exhibit in the front of Plaster Student Center, a special event uh, related to suicide awareness. Uh, Field of Memories uh, is so appropriate because 1,100 suicides are reported on college campuses annually in the United States. And as a result, there's some 1,100 small white flags placed in the grass on the North Mall, directly in front of Plaster Student Center to uh, provide that suicide awareness symbolism. Dr. Paul Thomason is our speaker this noon hour. He's a licensed psychologist with specialties in organizational, clinical, and experimental psychology. He's also vice president of research and quality assurance at Burrell Behavioral Health here in our community. He obtained his bachelor's degree in psychology and sociology from Southwest Baptist University, went on to earn an MA degree in general experimental psychology, and also the PhD in industrial organizational psychology, both from the University of Southern Mississippi. Paul uh, has served on the faculties of several universities and graduate schools. He's a regular contributor to the professional psychological literature, which covers a wide array of topics. He's responsible at Burrell for review of suicides as part of his many responsibilities at Burrell Behavioral Health, a community behavioral health care organization. So let's welcome for this noon session, Dr. Paul Thomason. Paul? Well, hello. Can you hear me? Yes? Okay, very good. Thank you guys so much for coming out on a, a noon hour, a lunch hour, to talk about what is admittedly, oftentimes, obviously, a gruesome topic. As Jim mentioned, it's one we don't talk enough about. And in the next hour, I'm going to hopefully provide you with some new pegs to hang your understanding on and some new understanding to hang on those pegs. Different ways of looking at suicide, perhaps, than you ever have. Anybody know what that is? Anybody ever been there? That's the observation deck at where? Anybody know? The Empire State Building, right? Uh, a familiar scene, but I use it as an exemplar. I use it as an example, a representative example of high places. And I know you've all been in high places, right? I want to start with this little phenomenon in the research literature called the high place phenomenon. Those psychological researchers are clever, aren't they? The high place phenomenon. You ever been in a high place at the precipice? of a canyon or a building or a bridge and felt an inexplicable urge to jump? That ever happened? At all? It's pretty common, actually. The research indicates that probably about a third of you have felt that urge. You may have been confused by it, probably were. But did it mean you are suicidal? Did it mean you were intent on dying? Not so much. In fact, again, of that, of that third, the vast majority, not suicidal at all, had never had any kind of suicidal ideation per se. Kind of an interesting phenomenon, don't you think? And in their inimitable psychological researcher kind of way, um, Hames and her colleagues at Florida State University said, the relationship between anxiety sensitivity and the high place phenomenon was potentiated among participants with low levels of suicidal ideation. What does that mean? Well, they did some interesting things analytically with these data. And here's kind of what it means. 
Anxiety sensitivity is not your current level of anxiety. It's the extent to which you are sensitive to anxiety, in a physiological sense in particular. The extent to which anxiety really causes you to ramp up heart rate and breathing. We all, that's a normal reaction for anybody, but there are variations in that. So anxiety sensitivity is one of the things they measured here, along with depression. So think about that for a second. What's actually happening? And I'll, I'll, you'll see in a minute why I chose to start with this, I think. If not, I'll try to make it clear. So imagine what you're, you've been the Grand Canyon or wherever high place, and you step up to the precipice, and immediately what happens? Probably a sense of anxiety. And those of you who are more sensitive to anxiety, immediately especially, are going to step back. And yet, what's going on? You take a look. Clearly a nice, sturdy platform there. I wasn't in any real danger, but yet I stepped back. Why? In response to this anxiety cue. The point of all that, interestingly, is that that survival instinct kicks in. That ancient, ingrained, very difficult to overcome impulse to life kicks in, and you step back. But yet there was that urge. So what's happening is, at least the researchers uh, have sort of surmised this, and I think it's a reasonable interpretation, is that your brain is frantically trying to make sense of what just happened. We are constantly observing our own behavior. You know, we do this with other people all the time, and we notice that more. Like I look at Jim, I observe his behavior, and I impute motives. I ascribe meaning to his behavior. Well, we do the same thing with ourselves, but we're doing it with ourselves, so we're, it's sometimes less than, we're sometimes less than aware of that. So what's happening is we're frantically trying to make sense of this thing that just happened. Well, it's safe, but I jumped back. What is that? I had this urge to jump. Long and short of it is, through all the psychological gyrations, the interpretation is, and in fact this is the name of the article in some fashion, the urge to jump is actually a, sort of a signal of the will to live. Interestingly enough, the urge to jump affirms the urge to live. So suicide looks like this in the most recent CDC top 10 causes of death. The green is suicide, and this is the lifespan. Take, take a second to look at that. Obviously from from infant to old age. The green is the cause of death, and the, the rank is this way. Over 42,000 deaths by suicide in 2014, the last year for which we have complete numbers. Suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the U.S. from all ages. Second leading cause of death in that entire, you saw the, the big band of green, from age 10 through 35, second leading cause of death. Suicide is four times as, as likely among males as among females, and yet, oddly, females are three times more likely to make suicide attempts. Strange. Without boring you with a lot, of, a lot more statistics, although I reserve the right to come back to some of that, and you saw the white flags, another powerful statistic, 1,100 on college campuses last year. An astonishing number. Long and short of it is, the what is so about this is that suicide is, without a doubt, an international public health problem. Some would say crisis. Think about this comparison. Pretty close, and yet, again, the scale tips towards suicide when you compare motor vehicle crashes, which we all know is a very common uh, cause of death. We're all inundated on your drive here, on your drive home, with reminders that motor vehicle crashes are dangerous and that they take lives. We have marquees on the side of the road telling us all manner of instructions about how we should drive and how we should not drive. We have rumble strips on the side of the highway that will jar us awake if we happen to start to, to drift over into the lane, right? We have airbags in our cars by federal mandate. We have seatbelts 
much longer than that even. We have car seats. We have all manner of interventions in place, systemic and otherwise, to prevent us from dying in car crashes. And it's been a spectacular success, by the way. But given the fact that there are even more people who die by suicide than by motor vehicle crashes, it begs the question, why are we not talking about it more? And where are the analogs? Where are the equivalents to rumble strips and airbags and seat belts and public information campaigns? You do see some of that. We'll come back to that in a little bit. But it's a relevant question, I think. I'm going to launch into this a little bit um, as a mythbuster um, and talk about some of the most, most common uh, mythologies surrounding suicide. And I think you will find, you'll find in, in yourself as we're going through some of these an impulse to argue with me, um, and you're welcome to do that later. Um, and I, I find as I kind of review these, which are based on some really solid research, I find that I, I'm arguing with myself a lot, and I'm challenging long-held ideas about suicide. And the reason it's important to dispel myths about suicide is that they oftentimes prevent us from having a meaningful conversation about it, from having a data-based, information-based, accurate description and, and discussion of suicide. It's way too important to give in to the myths. So let's talk about a few. And by the way, um, these are well summarized and along with about 20 others in Dr. Tom Joyner's book, Myths About Suicide. Tom Joyner is going to be, he's written a couple of books that they asked me if I had any books that I'd written on the subject. I said, no, but let me give you two that I wish I had written because they're the best things out there, in my view, on suicide. Those two books are Myths About Suicide and Why Do People Die by Suicide. Dr. Tom Joyner is a clinical psychologist at Florida State University who is uniquely qualified to be what I consider America's premier suicidologist. He's a clinical psychologist who also happens to be a survivor in the sense that his father um, shot himself in a van while he was in graduate school at the University of Texas. His maternal grandmother committed suicide. Or as my, my mental health first aiders would say, we don't say committed anymore because that's stigmatizing language. Died by suicide. So he has, and the, what, what I really love especially about why People Die by Suicide, that first book of his that made his, uh, his big mark, I think, is that he, has, he does the best job of anybody I've ever seen of weaving together <clears throat> research and clinical experience and personal experience into a, a, a whole that makes so much sense and that I hope will change the way you think about, about suicide, uh, whether you've ever considered it yourself or whether you know somebody who has or are intervening with somebody who has. So a few of these myths... Impulsivity. Suicide is an impulsive act, right? There's a lot of mythology surrounding that. It's just not so. In fact, um, as a psychological autopsy investigator, I can tell you I, I don't think I've ever seen one that I would consider truly impulsive. When you look behind the scenes, pull back the covers, you'll find that almost always it's not anything remotely like impulsive um, in the big picture anyway. A good example of that, an illustrative case, a TV reporter, a 29-year-old TV reporter in the, the Sun Coast of Florida in 1974. In a live TV broadcast, actually it was a broadcast about a shooting that had occurred at a local restaurant the day before. You've seen the type. You, you, you can turn on local TV and see those right now. She's doing that story. She does the, let's roll the tape. And it was literally taped in 1974. Let's roll the tape. Well, the tape jammed, and this is a direct quote upon the jamming of the tape. In keeping with Channel 40's policy of bringing you the latest in blood and guts, and in living color, you're going to see another first, an attempted suicide, upon which she reached underneath the desk, pulled out a pistol, and shot herself behind the right ear. Slumped forward, fade to black. She died 14 hours later at the hospital. How could she possibly have known the tape was going to jam? I don't know. Sounds awfully impulsive though, doesn't it? it? It certainly was not. It looks like it, but it's not. Things are not always as they appear, and that's certainly true, perhaps most of all, with suicide. Here's what we know. She reported depression and suicidal thoughts for years. In fact, had attempted to uh, overdose four years prior to that date. 
had covered a suicide story in recent weeks, and oddly, but not so oddly in retrospect, when talking to and interviewing the police officer, asked a lot of detailed questions about self-inflicted gunshot wounds. Told a colleague the week before she had actually bought a pistol and joked, of course, and I refuse to do air quotes, but in quotes, joked about committing suicide, dying by suicide on camera. Obviously, she had brought the weapon to the set either that day or maybe even before that, indicating forethought. She'd even written a story that uh, she wanted a colleague to read on the air following the story, following the event. So clearly, what looks impulsive almost, almost never really is. It almost, it almost always is the trajectory of despair and lots of planning and lots of wrestling and lots of thinking about it. And when it finally happens, for those who finally do die by suicide, it is never, almost never impulsive in, in nature. Suicide deaths have this duality to them. Of course, it seemed out of the blue. I can't tell you how many family members I've interviewed and talked to. I don't know. It's out of the blue. It doesn't make any sense to me. And they're shocked by the act. And yet, when we do this process that we do to try to understand, it's almost never truly impulsive. There's almost always a plan in place. That's why it's so important in prevention to talk about plans. Do you have a plan? Straight up. How would you do that if you were going to kill yourself? Suicide note myths, very quickly I'll just say, it's a lot more rare than you might imagine. I've never seen a study where there was more than 50% of, uh, of decedents, those who died by suicide, who'd left a note. But you look at all the studies, and probably a good estimate would be around one in four. About 25% of the time, there will be a, a suicide note. Why so few? You'd think, you know, this defining moment in life at the end of it, I want to document this, right? No, it happens fairly rarely, relatively rarely. Why? I think it's a function of the state of mind, and it helps us to get into, into that state of mind a little bit, to know the sense of abject loneliness, alienation, isolation, that state of mind in which essentially the answer to that question would be, why bother? Nobody cares anyway. Who would care about my reasons thusly stated for taking my own life. Or it simply doesn't occur to them at all. So another myth, it, it doesn't occur very often. When it does, it's, it's often very uh, interesting, obviously, and, and, and sometimes in, informative um, in, in the sense of really the, the true reasons. And sometimes there is a, a heartbreaking lashing out at uh, those who are left behind that, that can be uh, traumatizing in the extreme. Selfishness myths. Now you're gonna wanna argue with me about this. But uh, let's not get into semantics too much about this. But when I say selfishness, when, I, when you think about it from the standpoint of the big picture, I mean, I've said this myself uh, many, many times. I ain't going to lie about it. What an incredibly selfish thing to do. I'm compelled to say it. Why? Because I've seen the aftermath. I've seen the aftermath of people cleaning up literally and figuratively after people who have taken their own lives. And it looks unbelievably selfish. How could it be anything else? But I would challenge that thinking just a little bit on a couple of levels. Do they, how could they possibly, is really the question, is how could they possibly have done what they did in the living room, knowing the kids were going to walk in and find them? How could they do that? That is the most selfish thing in the world. How could they, in any number of other scenarios, how could they possibly have done this awful thing, knowing that it, what it would do to us. Well, they must not consider anybody else in their calculus. Well, the, the fact is that they do. But the calculus of the suicidal ideator, the suicide completer, as you, if you will, is such that when they do the math, them taking their life is worth more than them staying behind. That they, the, the net effect is beneficial in their mind. So in that sense, they're not really being selfish, just in that narrow sense. Of course, they're 180 degrees absolutely wrong. But that is the state of mind at the time, and that's what we need to understand. And also, just from the standpoint, again, you're talking, uh, you have a psychologist yapping at you, so we've got to think about some of these other things. I was thinking about this. 
if in fact selfishness is endemic to, inter, 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 sort of inextricably woven into the act of suicide, shouldn't we find higher suicide rates among those who are more selfish? Um, well, there is a group, diagnostically, of individuals out there called psychopaths, sociopaths, um, the, the Keckley psychopath, as they're sometimes called. These folks are all about themselves. These are the ones who are oftentimes characterized as having zero conscience and caring zero about anyone but themselves. Interestingly enough, the uh, suicide rate among psychopaths is exceedingly low. So another sort of way of thinking about that selfishness myth. And this is a hard one to get over, especially if you're a, uh, you know, a survivor, um, because obviously it feels like the most selfish thing that could have ever been done to you for the one you love to have left you in that horrible way. But just a different way to think about it. Seasonal myths. We all have bought this one, right? I get, I don't, I've been at Burl almost 20 years. I came there when I was eight. And uh, so every year I get a call from the local TV station and they're doing a story on seasonal depression, right? And suicide and all that. It's actually, lots of folks are sort of contributing and perpetuating this myth. But actually the holidays, the winter holidays in particular, there's a trough in the, in the rates of suicide. It actually peaks more like in spring and summer. Take a look at MSU's calendar around those months, and what will you find? I just saw the one out there scrolling, and it's really good now, but then it's like packed, right? Every kind of a possible gathering and an event going on. So I think, and this relates very directly to the theory I'm going to share with you, which is the best theory out there in my humble opinion, which also happens to be true, about why people die by suicide. This goes directly to it. That is belongingness, togetherness. I truly believe the reason those rates go down, literally, um, truthfully, around those holidays is that those are the times of, so in the, during the year, the most togetherness and the most opportunities for belongingness. Of course, there are that, there's that slice of folks who it just further uh, uh, sort of drives home their alienation when they're not invited or whatever. But the fact is the opportunities are there. And... Uh, so I think that's a really a contributing factor to that. Suicide rates for college students are lower than their peers who are not in college, probably for at least some of that reason. That is the issue of belongingness. We'll come back to that. Slow suicide myths. This is another one that I bought in. Uh, when I was in college, there was a band called AD, and they had a song called Slow Motion Suicide. I've been singing it since I was you know, 19 years old, uh, one time or another, and I've used it. Gosh a friend or a family or a client, a patient, they're just committing slow motion suicide. They're just self-destructive. They're just, they have a death wish. Again, you might want to argue with me about this, but you know what? When you think about folks who smoke cigarettes, do drugs, drink too much, engage in unprotected sex, jump out of it perfectly good airplanes, whatever. Are they really trying to kill themselves? No. Not really. Suicide behavior, suicidal behavior is characterized by a fairly, a fairly clear intent to die. You think folks who are doing those, even the, even the whole cluster of those kinds of things, really are trying to kill themselves? No, it's a much simpler explanation. It's Occam's razor, right? The simplest explanation is the best. They do it because it feels good and they like it. Whether or not it's contributing to uh, their early demise is another question. But human beings are not really good at mediating long-term anyway. We're really pretty immediate kind of creatures. So this idea of slow-motion suicide is probably largely myth. And it really goes back to that Thanatos energy of Freud. You remember from Psych 101, right? Freud's death wish. Not so much. So now I'm going to jump into Joyner's theory. Really important for us to understand and it's, as most good theories, as simple as can be, at least on the surface. We're going to dive a little deeper, but basically, an individual human being is not likely to die by suicide unless they have both the desire and the ability to do so. Why is that important? Well, because bottom line is, those folks who are at the, the highest risk, they're at the precipice of actually committing, dying by suicide, 
are the ones who have both of those. They have, it's a competency model. There are certain things that have to happen to, to predict who is actually going to take that step and overcome that most fundamental of taboos and actually take their own life. So desire and ability are the two components. It looks a little something like this. I'm going to presage it and I'll come back to it. I love Venn diagrams, right? And uh, psychologists are, are in love with these kinds of, uh, these kinds of models. And as, as with all things, it oversimplifies things a bit, but it's pretty good. And by the way, those of you, when, I, when you hear me talk about theory, there are many of you who are thinking, well, it's just a theory. Just a theory, just a theory. Just a theory is, it, we should, if it's a good theory, we should eradicate that from our, from our uh, language because uh, just a theory in psychological research, it means that that, that theory, which is a, a model for explaining and predicting, has been rigorously tested in peer-reviewed research. And this is the best one there is, in my humble opinion, with respect to that. Uh, one of my great intellectual heroes, the social psychologist Kurt Levine, said, there's nothing so practical as a good theory. This is a really good theory. So, two components are related to the idea of desire to commit suicide, and then one related to the ability. Thwarted belongingness, and don't you like that word, thwart? How, how often do you get to use that in common parlance, right? Thwart, to have been thwarted. Try it today, you'll like it. Just throw it out there. I'm feeling thwarted. Thwarted belongingness. Low sense of belongingness. Perceived burdensomeness. That is, I am alone and I am a burden. Those are the two things that create the desire. And the ability, I am not afraid to die. And I'm going to talk to you about what we know about how people get to each of those places. By the way, understanding someone, something doesn't serve as a, cause, as a cure. I understand that. But it's a good step toward it. If you understand the causal factors, if you understand what really predicts and explains suicide, you can go a long way toward mitigating and preventing it in ways that are simple and some that are very complex, and we're going to talk about those. When people hold these two very specific psychological states simultaneously, they will almost always develop at least the desire to die. The thought that I would like to be dead occurs to them if, in fact, they hold these two simultaneous psychological states. Perceived burdensomeness and a low sense of belonging or thwarted belonging. That's just to show you that the journal article that this was originally published in, um, so you can't read that from where you are, but um, I would uh, refer you to the book and to the, the peer-reviewed literature on this, um, and I'll explain what that means in a second. But how do you get to the place where you think, component number one, I am a burden? There's two basic components to that in this theory that are well supported by research on interpersonal relationships and outcomes. Liability, the feeling that my death will be a net benefit. My death is worth more than my life. My favorite movie of all time, It's a Wonderful Life. Y'all have seen it, probably, I know. 1946, it was before I was born too, so don't give me attitude. 1946, but one of, the, one of my favorite movies of all time. Watch it every year, of course. You know that scene where George Bailey is in the bar and he comes to the conclusion that you're worth more dead than alive right? That's, what, that's the essence of this. When a human being becomes convinced that their death would be a net benefit to those around them and to society at large, that's a, a powerful component, that liability. I am a liability to other people. That's related, by the way, positively to distress from homeless, homelessness, incarceration, unemployment, life circumstances. Physical illness is a huge one and one, one that's more and more relevant and salient to us as our population ages and chronic conditions become more, more prevalent and caregivers are more needed. Belief that one is a burden on one's family is a powerful psychological drag. So liability is first, and then self-hate, self-loathing. Don't underestimate the power of uh, bad self-esteem. <laughs> and don't underestimate the 
dangerous effect of footless, baseless self-esteem either. That's a whole other lecture. But uh, anyway, um, self-hate, low self-esteem, low self-worth, self-blame, shame, agitation. All those in the research are supportive of this domain of perceived burdensomeness. I am a burden. That's component number one to the desire to commit suicide. Component number two is that thwarted belongingness, low belongingness. I don't fit in. I am not a part of something larger than myself. The two components to this are loneliness, exemplified by that statement, I feel disconnected from others. This has to do with, of course, folks who, and I believe loneliness is a public health problem in itself. Loneliness, being disconnected from our fellow human beings. And the, you know what it feels like when you're really, if you've ever really been lonely, you know, you know what that feels like. It's excruciating. Low levels of pulling together, not feeling a sense of being connected to a community. There's a reason why community is so powerful and why we harp on it so much. There's a reason why I sit on the board of the community partnership at the Ozark. There's a reason why those of us who are interested in the public health solution or reduction of suicides ought to be working on building better communities, more inclusive communities, because that is a fundamental part of that second component of, of suicidal ideation. Thwarted belongingness directly related to those things. Having a life partner, having more children, having more friends, positively related, um, I should statistically be negatively related to thwarted belongingness. So the more people you have in your life, etc. Loneliness is the first component, and lack of reciprocal care. What does that mean? The great lesson of positive psychology, by the way, and psychology has been trapped in the deficit model since at least World War II, perhaps before, but thanks to uh, Marty Seligman and some others, we're beginning to pull our heads out of the sand or other places and uh, look at really what makes human beings um, what they really are, which is uh, extraordinary creatures with unbelievable strengths. But this is one of them. The, the mantra, one of the mantras of positive psychology is simply that other people matter. And they matter more than you can imagine, probably. And, well, until you, until you lose one. And then you can imagine it very vividly. Here we're talking about, I have no one to turn to, and I have no one to take care of. I can't even tell you the number of times I've been in sessions with or looked at the, the, in, during the review process um, looking at people who have, have a safety plan in place because they're expressing suicidal thoughts, at the number of them that said, I could never do that because my kids depend on me, because my mom and dad depend on me, because these people depend on me. That reciprocal relationship, uh, having someone to depend upon and having someone depend upon you is a powerful relationship to belongingness. And the more, the better, my friends. Family conflict, childhood abuse, Remarkable, pow remarkably powerful. Adverse childhood experiences. Incredibly powerfully related to that, that sense of belonging later, the thwarted belonging. The good news is there are so many ways in which we can fix that, begin to fix it at least. There are evidence-based approaches for beginning to move people beyond those traumatic experiences and allow them to connect in ways that they maybe never have before. And that's that. Burdensomeness and belongingness. If you have feelings of those that are intense enough and long enough, you're going to want to die. And you might tell somebody that. You certainly are going to think it. Maybe I should just, I really would like to. But does that mean you're going to? Not by any stretch of the imagination. Because why? As I said, ancient, ingrained, biophilic impulses to life. Very, very difficult to overcome. Not that it can't be done, but it takes some work. So again, the desire now should be, I hopefully, is clear to you. What, what creates a desire? What creates a desire to die is not being connected to other people and feeling as though you are worth more dead than alive. So, once you get there, the question is, who then is able to do that, take that next step, 
there's a lot of people. There are people in this room right now who are, if you were really honest, and of course I would never do this, but if you were to actually, we are to talk to you individually, um, I'm, there's a lot of heads that are going this way, at least internally. You felt it. Statistically, it's incredibly likely, obviously, that many, many people in this room have felt those, those senses of, I, I, I would like to be dead. And it's, it's, there's no mystery anymore to why that occurs. It's not inscrutable. It's very understandable, in fact, through the lenses of this very powerful theory. But again, how do you get to the next step? How do you acquire the ability to enact lethal self-injury? How do you get to a place where you can actually do what it takes to kill yourself? As I said, self-preservation, incredibly powerful. Not many people can overcome it simply by force of will. It's that powerful. Those who can, the relatively few, but the 42,000 last year in America alone, and that's, of course, an underestimate, they developed a fearlessness of pain. They developed a fearlessness of being injured. They developed a fearlessness of death. They acquired that through a process. It didn't just uh, you know, land fully formed in their minds and hearts. They developed it through a process, almost to a person, through experiencing, oftentimes repeatedly, very painful, traumatic, provocative types of events. So the acquired ability, lowered fear of death. You know what? Human beings have the capability to get used to all kinds of things. Many of you think, well, I could never be a mortician because there's no way I could. You know what? Pretty soon, working with uh, deceased bodies is just going to work. It's a mailman taking a walk. There's no, you become inured to it in some fashion. You can get used to all kinds of things as, as a human being that you're uh, obviously, when you look back at the trajectory, you can be surprised at yourself. How did I ever get there? But a lowered fear of death, elevated physical pain tolerance, yeah, I've seen a lot of that one. And that comes by practice, too, by the way. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that when I talk about self-injury. Family history of suicide is a very powerful predictor. You have lived through and seen the aftermath, and the unthinkable is thinkable to you. You've seen it. Another chink in the armor, so to speak. The clustering and exposure to suicides, those cluster suicides that we sometimes see, the copycat suicides, repeated suicides in a community or a school, all of that, the more exposure we have, the more normalized it can become in some bizarre way. Combat exposure, you know, folks who have been uh, on the front lines, um, and if uh, any of you are, uh, have served in the military, thank you for your service, and God bless you, and please don't ever, ever um, fail to reach out when you're experiencing these feelings, because through no fault of your own, obviously, you've become inured to, to death and suffering in a way that is fairly unique, to obviously, to combat soldiers. So exposure to combat, exposure to law enforcement situations that involve violence and shootings and all that. And again, it rears its ugly head. Childhood maltreatment. I know those people who are awfully resilient in their 40s and 50s and 60s who know you can't break me. My dad tried when I was six. Some people go that direction. Some people go the other. And it creates a vulnerability. But nonetheless, either way you go, it creates, it lowers the threshold for um, and it improves in some fashion your acquired ability to enact lethal self-injury. Once again, desire and ability to commit suicide. I hope that makes sense, and I hope it at least suggests to you um, some of the things we can do and say to begin to uh, intervene when we feel someone is, in fact, suicidal. I'm going to move on to another method. We use this in what's called the psychological autopsy investigation, uh, developed by the American Association of Suicidology. And if Joyner's model didn't do it for you, although I hope it did, um, because I think it's so powerful and it's, it's such a, 
a wonderful way of, of making sense of what sometimes is inexplicable. Um, so I hope that made sense, and I, I highly recommend those books. Um, but here's, for those of you who are um, all about the acronyms, um, the American Association of Suicidology has, and this is also literature-based, based on good research. There's a, uh, a technique, a tool that they have uh, for assessing both on the front end, that is, those who are at risk of suicide, and trying to explain or understand why those who have completed suicide, died by suicide, um, which factors kind of contributed to that. And it's called, Is Path Warm? And by the way, nothing at all contradictory. In fact, it's very complementary with Joyner's model of burdensomeness, belongingness, and acquired capability to commit suicide, die by suicide. Ideation, that first, first letter of the acronym or the acrostic or whatever this is. Uh, the, uh, the ideation, the idea. And again, we said there are two things that are likely to give you the idea. Can he keep hitting those? belongingness, burdensomeness, suicidal ideation, very particular kind of thinking. The fact that I uh, now have the desire, I'm thinking about it a lot. Not just thinking about what would it be like, but rather thinking, how might I do this? I want to do it and I'm beginning to think about doing it, that ideation. Substance abuse, I didn't mention this before, and I'm gonna say a word or two about this, that whole issue of uh, impulsivity, that goes out the window to some extent when there's alcohol involved or substances. Particularly alcohol, more the, the most common drug of choice on college campuses and in the world at large. You know what you're doing when you consume alcohol is you're anesthetizing that frontal lobe, right? Your brain has this marvelous frontal lobe system that takes care of what we call, what neuropsychologists call executive functioning. Yes, you have an executive making decisions in your brain, so your frontal lobe. And it can tamp down the response to those impulses. Or it can go out the window and you might say or do things that you normally wouldn't if you weren't anesthetizing your frontal lobe. So substance abuse is a very, very powerful, in fact, among young people, it, it rises to one of the top uh, predictive factors of who dies by suicide. Uh, because again, it changes the, th the threshold fairly dramatically. Purposelessness, multisyllabic, polysyllabic words. Purposelessness, having no purpose. Again, think about how all these relate to the Joiner's model. If you have no purpose, you don't belong, you're not contributing, that reciprocal care, all these are very much related. Anxiety, anxiety over time can be extraordinarily excruciating and painful. If you've ever just been anxious and worried for a long time in an intense way, you know sometimes you just want that to stop, and you'll do whatever you can to make it stop. Um, and those who are prone to suicide sometimes do it by stopping everything. Feeling trapped. We've heard many examples of this when we do uh, investigations. People feeling like they're trapped, financially trapped, relationally trapped in any number of ways. Trapped spiritually. Those who are convinced that uh, someone convinced them that God hates them and they're going to hell, they're trapped for eternity, um, might as well go ahead and get there. I mean, those kinds of things, trapped feelings, hopelessness. Tim Beck and Ed Schneidman, this was sort of the stock and trade for suicide theory forever um, until a joiner came along, I think, and put a finer point on things. Hopelessness is definitely related to suicide, but it's a little more broad and general than the kinds of uh, content that we're talking about, the kinds of thinking that we're talking about hopelessness. There's an anatomy to hopelessness, I would tell you, and that's scientifically uh, based as well. And Marty Seligman, that wonderful book called Learned Optimism, and a wonderful book called Authentic Happiness. Um, you can learn a lot about the anatomy of hopelessness, and, and there is a psychological anatomy to it, so to speak. Hopelessness, feeling as if nothing is ever going to change. Very powerful predictor. Withdrawal, social withdrawal, of course, warning sign, being angry. There's no question that sometimes suicide is an expression of anger against self or against others. Um, that's a relatively small um, proportion, but certainly does happen. Recklessness, beginning to be, take chances that one never took before. 
put together this constellation, especially again this last one, mood changes. They just don't seem like themselves. They've been dispositionally sunny forever. In the last few weeks, they've been sullen and withdrawn and irritable and, or whatever. So any of those mood changes for somebody that you care about should be taken seriously. Sometimes there's a fairly benign explanation for it, and sometimes not so much. Is PATH warm? It's a nice tool, and again, um, American Association of Suicidology, you can go and learn more about that, but it is a good uh, mnemonic device to remember some of the factors that you should think about in, in yourself or in someone that you care about in terms of, is there a, an elevated risk here? Last few things I want to talk about. Indeed, nine out of 10, 90% of people who die by suicide have a diagnosable mental illness or mental health problem. And that's probably an underestimate. You might say that the other 10% at least had a sub uh, sort of sub-syndromal, if you will, uh, sub-threshold disorder of some kind. Almost everybody who dies by suicide has a diagnosable mental illness. And what does that mean? You're like, duh. Well, we live in a culture that still, despite some really significant advances, still stigmatizes mental illness in ways that are shameful and counterproductive and heartbreaking. But the fact is, almost everybody who dies by suicide has a diagnosable disorder, and those are the big ones. Major depressive disorder, bipolar disorder, especially during the depressive phase. Alcohol or substance abuse, I asterisk that because that's, that's primary among younger folks. Schizophrenia and personality disorders, in particular, so-called borderline personality disorder. Fact is, nine out of 10, but only three out of 10 who died by suicide received any mental health services in the year before they died. And again, that's tragic beyond belief. So clearly, to put a finer point on it, to state the obvious, early detection and treatment are the keys to saving more lives. This is, uh, this is an outgrowth of the National Suicide Prevention Initiative that has been in place for over 10 years and has gotten re-upped in the last few. This is a resource that I would like to make sure you're aware of. 1-800-273-TALK. This is a crisis line, 24-7, free, obviously. And the nice thing about it is they are connected to a network of local crisis centers with trained individuals who can help connect people to appropriate services, who can raise that number, hopefully, from three uh, to, uh, to much more and lower that number of those who obviously who die because they didn't get treatment for their mental illness. There are effective treatments waiting just outside the door. The MSU Counseling Center, they have the nice uh, sign up there out by the white flags. They have people trained there who have been trained to help you, to help people who are thinking about suicide, planning suicide, to change their minds in the most fundamental ways, change their minds for good. And uh, the, again, the tragedy is for that to be there and not to be, uh, to not be uh, used because it's there. Prevention of suicide. I mentioned rumble strips and airbags and guardrails and all that. What are the analogs? What are the equivalents of that for suicide prevention? Well, there are a lot of them. Mental health first aid, I'm gonna talk about that. I'm a proud uh, new instructor as of December. I got certified to do mental health first aid trainings. It's a day-long thing. I just did one on Tuesday down in Branson with about 15 people on youth mental health first aid. I'll talk more about that in a minute. That's part of a national effort, and Missouri can be very proud. You can be very proud to be in Missouri, which is one of the two states that worked uh, with the folks from Australia who began this, this whole pro uh, process and this product, this approach. Um, and Missouri's been right in the middle of it. Access to mental health treatment. That is a fundamental suicide prevention um, strategy, of course. Means restriction. Why don't we have guardrails at, this, at the Golden Gate Bridge? I think they're actually doing that now. Lots of people die at the Golden Gate Bridge, and there's some fascinating stories, by the way. Look it up. Fascinating. And uh, very few people have survived it, but those who have, to a person, you know what they say? I knew I made a mistake as soon as I went over. 
to a person. Means restriction. Getting guns out of the house. I mean, I just dealt with this yesterday. We know there are guns in the house. You need to get them out. Your son is thinking about killing himself. himself. And do not keep a gun in the house. Restrict his access to any means by which he can take his life. So that's a very basic public health approach. Hotlines and support, I mentioned uh, 273 Talk, there's a 1-800-SUICIDE. There's Crisis Text, a crisistextline.org for the texting generation. Um, and it's actually staffed by volunteers. Um, and look that up if you, if you have an interest. The Borough Crisis Assist Team is available 24-7, 761-5555, 1-800-395. Two one three two, www.hopeline.com. There's a lot of resources out there telephonically, telehealth, online, by text. There's no lack of support and there's no lack of intervention available if we can just get folks to access it. QPR, built on the CPR model, uh, easy to remember. Question, perf- persuade, and refer is a very powerful suicide prevention model that you can get in. You can do the training in schools or in workplaces. Very powerful, simple technique. It empowers people to interact with others and to say, are you doing okay? Are you thinking about killing yourself? Persuade them that they need to get help and refer them to appropriate treatment. It's a really nice buttoned up model. What they have in common, by the way, with mental health first aid is that it gives you a set of tools and it empowers and emboldens you to be able to talk to people about things that we normally don't talk about because they're just way too personal. And SAMHSA's National Registry of Effective Programs and Practices, by the way, which you can Google and find immediately, has 24 interventions listed as evidence-based, either evidence-based, that is, good outcomes or promising practices for suicide prevention for a wide range of age groups and a wide range of settings. There are technologies growing all the time to help us put guardrails in place, put rumble strips in place, put airbags in front of people who are seriously intent on taking their life. Let me talk about this by way of conclusion. Mental health first aid, I'm here to, as a proselytizer, a bit, a bit of a preacher on on this because I believe in it. Mental health first aid, there's an adult version, there's youth version, there's a new veterans version that's coming out. It's a one-day commitment to spend a day learning about how to help, giving you a set of, again, pegs, tools, giving you a tool belt or a toolbox to help you talk to people who are wrestling with, struggling with mental health problems or crises. As we said, 90% plus of people who, who die by suicide have a mental health problem, and they can be saved. First aid is given until appropriate treatment and support are received or until the crisis resolves. What do you learn? You learn about risk factors, information on depression. You learn a five-step action plan. Nothing like a good five-step action plan to help you feel empowered, to help you develop the self-efficacy to intervene, to talk to somebody when they need help. And you develop uh, an awareness of evidence-based, professional, peer, and self-help resources when you do this one-day training. This is the five-step action plan, by the way, and we do love those acronyms. Algae, and there's a cute little koala bear sorted in Australia, right? Um, named Algie, who's the mascot. But this is the, the, uh, the thing that you'll learn if you do that one day. You learn to assess for risk of harm or suicide. You learn to listen non judgmentally, which is really hard, by the way. Really hard. We all think we're good at it. Almost none of us really is. We could all use a little help learning how to listen non judgmentally. Because if you listen with judgment, you can lose somebody quickly giving reassurance and information, encouraging appropriate professional help, and finally encouraging self-help and other support strategies. That's the algae model. That's the mental health first aid. That is one of the great hopes that I have for improving suicide rates in this country. They have a, a program right now. Wow, look at that. It just went off. And I'm just on my last slide. How good am I? huh? Not that good. So they have a new uh, campaign that I'd like to make you aware of. And again, I am, I am here to, in some fashion, encourage you to become involved in this. 
um, the National Council for Behavioral Health, Missouri Department of Mental Health, Maryland Department. They're doing a, 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 a campaign called One in a Million. So there's 500,000 folks in America that have already been trained in, in mental, as what we call mental health first aiders. We want to do a million folks by the end of next year. So check it out, mentalhealthfirstaid.org, and go be one in a million and save a life. Thank you very much. Time for a question or two? Anybody have a question? Hi, so um, I have a friend who um, he doesn't want to get treatment, but it's also because he doesn't have health insurance. How should he go about getting treatment for that? You said he doesn't want to get treatment? He's kind of like telling me that he doesn't want it, but at the same time, he mostly can't afford it, and that's the biggest reason, but a smaller underlying reason is just that he simply doesn't want it. So you, you think the reason he's not getting it is because he can't afford it or doesn't yeah. have a way to pay for it? In that case, make sure he calls Burrell Center. Okay. Make sure we are the Community Mental Health Center. We have ways and means of getting treatment for folks who are indigent, who have uh, no way of funding it otherwise, and for helping them get enrolled in whatever benefits they can get if they're not. So, and we have a free clinic. Um, in fact, it's staffed by doctoral level, uh, pre-doctoral level psychology uh, interns. And so, and we have a, a whole support network. And so please refer them to us, have them call me. Where is uh, that clinic at? What's that? Where is that clinic at? Borough Center, we have a, a variety of locations, but our main location is right across from Cox Health down south on uh, East Bradford Parkway. Where okay. all the goose and all the, the geese are. All right, thank you. You bet. Other questions? Hi. Um, just recently, a month ago, a family member committed suicide in our family. <laughs> and he was older, he was 65. We hear a lot about what youths are triggered, but what leads a person who is, who has family, children, grandchildren surrounded to make that decision? I don't think I heard the, the question. What was the last part? What leads a person who has so much around them that has the support system, who has children, who has grandchildren, who has a good job, who has a marriage, who has a life, all of a sudden, I mean, we came to find out that it wasn't nearly as all of a sudden, but what's different? Because we hear a lot about youths and what triggers youths to you. make that decision, but somebody that's lived for 65 years to make that decision. Yes. Thank you for the question. I, and obviously I, I, I hear the emotion and, and that's the, the thing is, the rate looks like this across the lifespan. It's going up and up and up. And you know that piece about, about burdensomeness? The older folks get, and it can look like they've got the, you know, the world by a string, and they've got everything in the world going for them, they have all this support. Um, but really, again, what's going on between their ears is that they've convinced themselves, almost always, that they are a burden. That they, and so that's, you know, again, that, as I said, understanding doesn't serve as a cure. But my God, it serves as an excellent entry point into talking to them about, about that, you know, and doing what we can to assure them that, you know, there's no place else I'd rather be than right here with you, right by your side, taking care of you. This is the joy of my life being with you. And I don't know what his circumstance is, but I can tell you for sure that the older we get, and that is the highest rate, by the way, per 100,000 population is males over 60 or so years old. It's about 39 uh, per 100,000. It's the highest rate of all males in that range. And uh, we, it's a function of the developmental phase of, the, of life in many cases. Men, males are raised in this culture, of course, from the time we're this big to be strong, to take care of. And the moment we begin to think about that, turning that corner where all of a sudden we are, not only are we not taking care of the people in our lives that we've been entrusted with, it's how we feel oftentimes, but we are now a burden on them. That is such a fundamental shift psychologically that it can, that can be quite shattering. And, but the thing is, I can tell you, 
Those people, we can help. Psychologists can help. Physicians can help. Support. Once you know what the issue is, once you know, you can help. You can change. You can begin to move that, that needle with respect to their feelings of belongingness and burdensomeness. Fix those two, and it doesn't matter how comfortable they are with, with lethal means. Those are the things we have to work on. Thank you very much. Thank you kindly for your attention, and uh, I, I wish you well.